Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Kime Report. Wherever you get your podcast, you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media. That's A-M-P-I-R-E. Always much appreciated when you tune in. And don't forget, you can read my work on ESPN.com. And for you gold members, I'm going to be doing a private Zoom for you at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Wednesday night. So join me there. Bring your questions. If you want to become a club member, go to the Empire Media YouTube page. Hit the See the word join. Click on there. Find the level of membership you want, and we'll take it from there. All right. Today, I'm going to be joined by ESPN NFL Draft and pro analyst Matt Miller. Matt can talk about free agency. We talk a little bit about that. We talk a lot about the quarterbacks, and I wanted to go over each of the top three that you would say are in this discussion for the number two pick. Obviously, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, and J.J. McCarthy. Why? He matches to the seven-round mock, mock draft. He he picked Jaden Daniels for Washington, but we went over why he likes Daniels over the other two and just some concerns that he might have about each of them, you know, the pros and cons of each guy, the fit for Jaden Daniels at, at quarterback for Washington, and, you know, many more things. But he also Matt also did a seven-round mock, so I wanted to go over some of his selections for Washington because I think it's he's filling areas where they can get players who can help them, certainly this year and then down the road, at positions where they certainly need some help, defensive end, cornerback, even tight end. So we get into all that, but again, a lot of a lot of talk about the quarterbacks because I like hearing from different perspectives on guys. And the more people you hear from, I think the 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 more you can start to formulate who would make the most sense for Washington. Before I get there, just a couple of quick nuggets. One Washington signed quarterback Jeff Driscoll on Monday. He now he'll become well. He's now right now their third quarterback, but in about a month he'll be one of four quarterbacks on the Commanders roster. Adam Peters had said. He wanted to have four quarterbacks in camp. Now you have three. They'll add one in the draft and go from there. Driscoll, of course, is experienced. And so, you know, he'll compete with Jake Fromm for a spot on the roster, whether it's practice squad or the 53. Washington also signed running back Jeremy McNichols, um, another veteran. He's only really had a couple of years where he's had a lot of product, uh, was had some good productivity and hasn't, he had um, some injuries and, and, he, had, he hasn't played as much since 2021, but he's the guy who can perhaps help them in a backup role. He'd be one of four running backs right now. They need to add some more bodies there to get through camp. You definitely need to add a couple more bodies there. So you know, whether it's through the draft, undrafted free agency, after the draft, whatever, they're going to have to have more help there because the guys you have in the roster now, it's Brian Robinson, Chris Rodriguez, Austin Eckler, and now Jeremy McNichols. Um, certainly not enough guys to to get through a training camp um, and maybe not even an OTA. Um, so look for them to add a couple more guys at that position. But McNichols, again, another he's a veteran, he's bounced around the league a little bit, but he did have he has, you know, he had a couple years with Tennessee where it looked like he was starting to get some things done. And so we'll see what happens there. Anyway, that's it from me. Now, here's my conversation with ESPN's Matt Miller. Trades, free agents, quarterbacks, and all kinds of adventures await the Commanders this offseason. Looking for an adventure of your own? The Adventure Park at Sandy Spring has you covered. The country's largest ropes course and zipline park, located in Montgomery County, Maryland, is now open. Named Best Amusement Park and Climbing Destination in the DMV two years in a row, the Adventure Park at Sandy Spring is perfect for birthdays, corporate outings, groups, and families. With challenges anywhere from beginner to expert, there is something for all skill levels. Anytime you're thinking about reaching new heights, make sure you know before you go. The Adventure Park at Sandy Spring is the only ACCT accredited park in Maryland or Virginia. Staying on the ground? Give axe throwing a try. You can throw at traditional targets or play any number of interactive games. You can even upload your own image. So there you have it, folks. Climbing, zip lining, axes, food, and bonfires right in your backyard. Reserve your adventure today at www.theadventurepark.com backslash kime. That's www.theadventurepark.com backslash kime. 
All right, Matt. Well, first of all, thanks for coming on here. Let's let's start with the obviously the obvious topic here. And I'm going to get into free agency in a minute, but the quarterback class of this draft. And in your seven round mock, you had Jaden Daniels coming to Washington. For you, what was a separator between him and Drake May? And did you even consider JJ McCarthy at that spot? Yeah, I re- I actually you know considered all three. I, I think that's something that you have to do this time of year. You know, given that I was also. While I was riding the mock draft, John, I was at the Michigan Pro Day, and I'm watching Cliff Kingsbury spend 20 minutes with John Beck, who was running the Pro Day workout for McCarthy. So it's like all that information is in your head. Sometimes we can let it cloud our you know, information or our judgment to some degree, um, but also sometimes, you, it, sometimes it does stick. So what it basically came down to for me is Jaden Daniels is my highest rated quarterback outside of Caleb Williams. And I don't think there's anything that says he's not a good fit for Washington. If he were my top rated guy, but we were saying, nah, they're not going to, they don't want a quarterback who's going to run around and make plays with his legs. That might disqualify him a little bit, but we know Cliff Kingsbury has, you know, very much preferred quarterbacks who can run around and create at least, you know, can be creators in the pocket, if not dynamic playmakers out of the pocket. So when I look at Jaden, you know, the, the ability that he has as a runner and a thrower, I think, makes him really attractive for Kingsbury. And it's, it is funny, and I'm sure you get this too, how much responsibility we are assigning to an offensive coordinator, not the head coach, not the general manager, right. but every time we talk about Washington, we talk about Kingsbury. And I, I do, you know, I even catch myself doing that. I think it's super important. At times, we have to step back and say, this will be an Adam Peters decision. This will be a Dan Quinn decision. And of course, they're going to rely on Cliff a lot to, to find out what type of quarterback he wants. But, you know, this is going to be Josh Harris on down. We'll be involved in making sure that they get the right quarterback. So I don't want to read too much or too little into what Kingsbury likes, but he's just one part of this puzzle for them. And it's funny because with, with Daniels in that system, what other factors that you go into? Because obviously, you know, he's had those quarterbacks who can run. And, but what other factors go into making that kind of offense? And I know he'll always say it's not really an air raid offense, it's a, but, but there is yeah, an element of is. the passing <laughs> game, clearly. So what other elements yeah. that Jaden offers would put, make him a good fit here? Yeah, you know, I think he's the best deep ball passer in this class. And the numbers back that up. That's not just, you know, me watching tape and saying, oh, he's great at it. The numbers actually, you know, show that as well. When you have Terry McLaurin and you have Jahan Dodson, who are both fantastic vertical stretch weapons, I think that's where Jaden does become a really good fit over a Drake May or a J.J. McCarthy is because of what he does from the pocket as a vertical thrower. That would get me pretty excited about him, not to take anything away from from Drake May or J.J. McCarthy, but the experience factor, you know, being a a five-year player, certainly valuable, having two years of fantastic production in the sec would make me feel a little bit better about his readiness to step right in and play as well and i think that's something that's important with washington you know maybe more so than the other places we know they had a marcus Mariota. i think that is even a little bit of a hint of the type of quarterback that they want but you know other than some of the other situations where new england has a jacoby Brissett, minnesota has a sam darnold i think you know, Washington is a spot where this quarterback they selected to is going to have to be able to play right away. And to me, that experience factor for Jaden would, would certainly factor in. And everybody always, and I think you mentioned too, like with Drake May, the upside that he has. And you can read that a couple of ways. He hasn't gotten there yet, but can he get there? So yeah. if you're weighing that decision, if you're Washington, like, do you think like in five, six years that May is going to be the best quarterback, you know, or maybe the the better quarterback? And how do you weigh that into a decision? Because it seems like Jaden Daniels can also improve too. Yeah, they all can. And I think with Jaden, that's a really important point. No one improved more over the last year than Jaden Daniels to go from where he was after that 2022 season at LSU and watch him get better playing from within the pocket, be smarter about how he uses his legs, smarter about how he protects himself as a runner. That, that shows that he can still continue to get better. I think oftentimes we look at quarterbacks who are raw and say, oh, well, they have a ton of upside. That also is usually how you get fired, is by drafting <laughs> someone and them not realizing their upside. So, you know, I'm a, I'm, uh, I wouldn't say a lot lower than my counterparts, but I am lower than, my, than our colleagues. And when it comes to Drake May, I think he, of all of the four quarterbacks that get talked about a lot as being selected in the top five or six selections, 
I think Drake May is the one where the situation is going to matter the most and also the one where having a quarterback that he can learn from is going to be really important. You know, the, only a two-year starter at North Carolina – not playing the same level of competition that a J.J. McCarthy did at Michigan, despite also being a two-year starter. J.J. also had some playoff runs that added four games to his resume, um, that gave him some experience. So with Drake May, the arm talent and the mobility definitely make you excited about his potential, which is a scary word. But I would also say, you know, the interception, some of the decision-making makes me really worried if he has to go out there and carry a team right away. And that's what I was going to ask you too. Like, what are some of the things that you say get, that would give you pause on him? And you hear mechanics, you hear he's got the longer delivery. What are some besides those issues? And what do you see in those issues that lead to questions, I guess? Is it the why they throw yeah. the interceptions, et cetera? It is the why a lot of times with him. I think, you know, for me, it starts with Drake May with the, you know, the throwing motion, the lower body mechanics lead to some inaccuracy. And those inaccurate passes are what lead to the interception. So it's not even so much of like, I always go back to this. I remember I was a big Josh Allen guy. And I remember watching Josh clean up his process, you know, the clean up his arm angle, clean up some of the footwork stuff that was leading to inaccuracy. And you watched him get better at it. And you felt, you felt good about his progress even before he took a snap for Buffalo with Drake may, you know, we haven't seen a senior bowl. We haven't seen a combine. It's just a pro day. And guess what? Early in his pro day, there was some inaccuracy. Right. So that says to me, okay, well, some of these issues are are carrying over. Those those problems with lower body mechanics, with arm angle, are what are leading to the mistakes and the miscues. So that's where I get a little bit scared where it's not so much, oh, this is getting cleaned up and we're seeing the work in progress. You know, watch how many times his receivers are chasing passes or how many passes, despite having a strong arm, you know, he's, he's throwing passes in the dirt. That stuff scares me a little bit. 16 career interceptions. Normally, you'd like to see a guy improve year to year in terms of, of you know, incompletions and turnovers. With Drake May, he actually got worse year to year. So that that all scares me a little bit. And I, I hate to make helmet comparisons, but Sam Howell was the same way at North Carolina where we saw, you know, that red hot start year one. Year two, it dropped off. And a lot of those issues followed him to the NFL. It didn't get worked out. So with Drake May... You really have to have a plan to work on the mechanics, but also, you know, you can teach a lot pre-snap processing, I believe, if a player has the aptitude for it. But that in-game processing, I think, is really, really hard to learn, especially because so many guys are just thrown out there and you got to learn on the fly. That's hard to do. So, you know, with with Drake, I think you have to have that plan to teach that in-game processing so that you don't have those turnover and turnover worthy plays. And, you know, part of it, too, is I know the people who like Drake Mayer say, but his talent was worse around him the second year. Same with Hank Sam. So what so but but everything you're pointing out is really more about his mechanical flaws. It seems like is that what what do you say? Yeah, I think, you know, with every player, we could do the same thing, John, for Caleb Williams and say, well, he lost Jordan Addison, you know, and that they're not going to have another they're not having offensive lineman drafted this year USC isn't so we could do that with a lot of these guys outside of Jaden Daniels um, and say oh well you know look at the drop off there Marvin Harrison Jr. went from CJ Stroud to Kyle McCord and his numbers were identical basically Mm -hmm. so you we you can play that game with a lot of players I think for Drake May it's just like that's a really convenient excuse when he had Tez Walker who is going to be drafted probably higher than Josh Downs was or very similarly drafted you know, some of those issues still show up. So what I try to do is put every player in a little bubble and not get so focused on the production and what's around them, but get, you know, hyper-focused on the result of the play. You know, if you can make a bad throw as a quarterback, your receiver still catches it, it shows up in the stat sheet as a catch. But it was a bad throw, and we all know it was a bad throw. And vice versa, you can make a great throw that your receiver drops. That doesn't show up in the stat sheet. So when I evaluate these quarterbacks, I try to look at that. And that's where for Drake May – I see his guys chasing a lot of passes over the last two years where they saved his butt more often than not. What would be your concern for Jaden Daniels? You know, body type is, is a big one. And, and body type also because he played loose and fast with it, go back and watch FSU week one. He's getting thrown around. I mean, there's some WWE type tackles where those Florida state guys are just throwing him all over the field. He did get smarter with that. That is a concern. And just like we were talking about with, with Drake May, you, you okay, well, level of talent around him wasn't great. That is is a concern to some degree. With Jaden, it's, 
You know, how often did Brian Thomas and Malik Neighbors save him? How many plays are, you know, where he's missing a little bit, but Brian Thomas has the, you know, wingspan of Zion Williamson, it looks like, and he's just pulling in errant passes. How much are those guys saving players like that? So, you know, you can't can't completely discount it either way, like we were just talking about, right? You have to factor all that in. And so the talent level that Jaden had at wide receiver is really impressive. You know, offensive line play at LSU was not great this right. past year. You know, it did get better over the course of the season. But, you know, I think the, the biggest thing is he's probably going to have to learn to playing, you know, on time uh, as opposed to being able to run around and make plays. Same for Caleb Williams. You know, these guys just have to learn to play on time. But if there was a, a headline for Jaden Daniels, it would be, you know, the slender frame is is the big concern. And, and yeah, and I think at the Florida State game, you saw him getting – I always point this one out. He tried to hurdle the guys in the middle of the field. Like I've never seen that, do that. Fr- from a quarterback. Yeah. No. Um, but with, so when you're watching Jaden and you see, we see the talent again. So how do you separate? And is it, you know, what did you see because of that with that talent and and how, what he yeah. did within the context of that offense? Yeah. Like I said, he was the most improved player in college football last year. I, know, I mean, he won the Heisman as the the most outstanding player, but he was the most improved as well. He learned how to play comfortably from within the pocket, whereas I felt like at Arizona State, it was like one, two, throw it deep. And then in 2022 at LSU, it got a little bit better. It was almost like one, two, throw it deeper run. Well, last year, it was more of a let me get through my progressions. Let me get through my reads. Let me play complimentary football. And it, it took off for him. I also think we see this so often year two in a scheme for a guy, year two with Brian Kelly. He went like this, Mm -hmm. you know, it's Joe Burrow at LSU. It was year two and he went, you know, he takes off. So often a guy is year two and we see them, you know, ascend. And I think that was a big part of it for Jaden. He just got comfortable, but you know, everything he does, he feels like he's in control, whether it was deep ball passing, secondary scrambling, designed running. He just felt like a guy who the game had really slowed down for this year. And you saw that in his command. So, um, you know, it, it was picture perfect year as a thrower, as a runner. I, I think the stat was 22 touchdowns, zero interceptions on vertical routes this year, which is like basically crazy. No one does that. But he did that while being you know, more of a full field guy, you know, this year. It wasn't just let me launch it deep. It was let me process and actually make some of these reads and plays. And I think that's where his game came together. It wasn't just the ascension of neighbors and Thomas. I think you could say for those guys. You know, it's the chicken or the egg. How much did he help them become who they were as opposed to how much did they allow him to be the guy he was? And pretty much whenever I talk to people, it's always been, if you ask them about Jaden or Drake, they're all, they're going to say Jaden. And so, but JJ McCarthy has slipped up there too. And I'd be surprised if they took him at two because of what you hear about Jaden Daniels, but you know, he's a guy that gets mentioned. So pros and cons of JJ McCarthy. Pros 27 and one as a starter. And that, you know, like a lot of people, will be, oh, quarterback wins, that doesn't matter. Uh, NFL scouts will tell you it does. They want a guy who's been in a system and won and elevated the town around him. And that, that absolutely matters. Uh, JJ also, despite losing one game in college, plays with this monumental chip on his shoulder. I think, and he hears the things that people say of, oh, he didn't have to carry this team. He doesn't have to do this, doesn't have to do that. And that that factors into how he plays. You know, he is coming out of an NFL style system at Michigan where it's a lot of under center, a lot of play action. There were times they ran the ball a lot, as we know. There were also times where they might run the ball 13 out of 15 plays, John, and then ask him, oh, wait, it's third and seven, JJ, go save us. And he did it. And so he didn't get to get into a rhythm like a lot of these other guys did. It was just hey, we need a big play. We're going to throw this on your back. Hope you can get it done. And he would. So he's got the arm talent to make drive throws. He can dial up different velocity. I talked to him at the Michigan Pro Day. He's really been trying to work on touch throwing and, you know, giving his guys more of an opportunity to make plays. That certainly, you know, shows up on tape where he struggled with that a little bit, especially throwing to his left at times. He's worked to clean that up. Um, I, you know, I think he could be a little bit sticky on his reads at times where it's like, boom, he's locking on that first guy and he's got to work to get off that. But I also think he knows that and and is working to get better at that. Um, you know, he's he's tough to evaluate because of how limited the throwing was 
Whereas we can watch Jaden Daniels or Caleb Williams and Drake May. You can watch one game and see every scenario and situation you want almost. It might take six games to watch JJ do that. So it is, you know, yes, he was asked to do a lot in big moments. Um, and he had to overcome a lack of rhythm just within the, you know, the framework of how they were calling plays there. But also, you know, he wasn't asked to do a lot of times. And that's not to say he can't or won't. It's just that it's the great unknown of he wasn't asked to do it. And so it creates a question mark. What's the gap between he and Jaden in your mind? It's pretty big. I think I have Jaden as my number five overall player. I have JJ as my number 19. Okay. So it is, it is pretty big. I, I think, you know, for quarterback scheme matters so much. I, and, you know, speaking specifically to Washington, I think JJ could have a lot of success there because they have, you know, there's some really good targets there. There's some really good weapons. There is, you know, a strong, uh, you know, run game structure there. The offensive line, you know, particularly at left tackles, what's going to worry me, you know, JJ played behind none of the, none of the Michigan linemen, offensive linemen are going to be drafted early, but they're all going to be drafted. They were all seniors. So he's going from, and you talk to offensive line coaches, the number one thing they want along the offensive line is continuity. Michigan had that. He's going to, no matter where he goes in the NFL, there's, you know, going to be less continuity up front. So that would be what worries me, you know, as he goes to Washington, I think he fits with the scheme really well. I think he would fit with Dan Quinn really well. Um, it's just, you know, this offensive line is a little bit beleaguered, and that's going to be something that's new for him. And and so you also did a seven-round mock, which I commend your courage for that. <laughs> and um, But in there, now obviously Washington goes out, you follow free agency very closely, so you know that they signed three defensive ends. But two of yep. the top, in the in their top 100 picks, or top 100 of the NFL draft picks, you have – couple defensive ends, Darius Robinson. And I think yeah. you also had uh, Adisa Isaac, right? So yes. what, yep. what did you, what, why, if, why go that route? And part of this, my only two cents is their free agency thing allows them to go best player available too. And so if it's defensive ends, you take them, but yep. your, your rationale. Yeah. You know, that a lot of these guys that they did sign uh, are not long-term building right. blocks. You know, they didn't go after the Bryce Huffs in free agency. You know, you go after a, a Dante Fowler, who's been, you know, a, a journeyman at this point. Uh, Dorrance Armstrong, who, you know, was a, a backup type player for the Cowboys. He would be the one where I said, like, they gave him the type of money right. where I would think he, you know, three years, 45 million, um, you're up to 45 million. Right, right. He's probably one of the more building block guys. Cleveland Farrell, one year journeyman. So the, the Cleveland Farrell and the Dante Fowler signings, I didn't view those as that's going to keep you from drafting some of these guys. So I had going there. You know, Darius Robinson, who I had going there in the second round, is an inside outside player. You know, he could he would be more of like what Chase Young was, you know, at you know, 285 pounds. He's gonna be more of a power defensive end, would play really well opposite uh, a Dorrance Armstrong. And then with Adisa Isaac, you know, that's more of your stand-up edge rusher uh type player that, you know, if something doesn't work out. I think so often you have to have three pass rushers yeah. on the outside in today's NFL. You know, we just saw the Jets do that with how they acquired Hassan Reddick. So I would think Isaac would be someone that would pair really well with Armstrong and Robinson. Now you've got the two speed guys with the power guy. And again, just under the belief that Fowler and Farrell are more depth guys than they are, you know, building block type players. And I agree wholeheartedly with that. And I think it gives them the freedom. If they want a guy there, you can take them because you're, you're not committed to these guys long-term. And as you know, you always need defensive ends and pass rushers. So the other one is Patrick Paul, the tackle um, from Houston. Yep. And, you know, so, because everybody's like, oh, they got to get a left tackle. There's your guy. So what do you like about him? And how is he a guy that can play soon? Playing soon would be a little bit of a worry for me just because I think coming out of that system, he's not ready in the run game. But, you know, legendary wingspan over 86 inches, which is just bonkers, but also great athleticism to be 330 pounds and run uh, 513 in the 40 yard dash. So you you start to look at those traits and you get really excited about him. He's just got to get a little bit better lower body strength. He needs some developing, but you're at pick 40 you're not finding someone with those traits, generally speaking. And I'm, I'm with Washington fans like, yeah, you would love to solve the left tackle problem. Um, you know, maybe you can do that at 36, but we're going to see, you know, we might see 10 offensive linemen drafted in the first round. And so the cupboard gets pretty bare at the top, even at the top of the second round, whether it's at 36 or 40, you know, you're starting to bet on traits over guys who are ready to step in and play right away. Where do you think if they wanted to trade back into the first round to get a guy that can come in and play and 
be a long-term answer. How, where do you think they'd have to get to, to, to make sure they yeah. get that guy? Gosh, right now, you know, I would, I look at Dallas at 24, Green Bay at 25, Tampa at 26. Those three teams could all go offensive line. So you're almost trying to get to 23, which is where the Vikings are right now. And they are very likely to use that to try to move up to get a quarterback. So that will probably be the Arizona Cardinals at 23. They're another team that could also take an offensive lineman. So, you know, you could have to get up there pretty high. Uh, A lot of teams in the 20s need an offensive tackle. I guess the good news is because of some of these moves they made in free agency, you know, three defensive ends, some offensive guards, you could look at 36 and 40 as, you know, you could move those. How high do 36 and 40 get you into the first round to potentially get one of those left tackles? But that's the spot where they got to be watching for a run. You know, I I think the obvious connection would be, oh, Adam Peters, just call San Francisco up. But San Francisco needs offensive line help as much as anyone does. So, so many teams, you know, really starting with Pittsburgh at 20, so many of those teams need offensive line help that it's it will be a difficult spot to try to get up into uh, just because of how how valuable those those picks are along the offensive line this year. So I want to go over the two other picks that you had in this mock um, Kyrie, in the top 100, Kyrie Jackson, cornerback Morgan, and then Theo Johnson, tight end from Penn State. Yeah, Kyrie Jackson, I, I think where there are not some injury questions would be drafted quite a bit higher just because, you know, a six foot four corner yeah. uh, who has ball skills, uh, very, very physical this could be a very different type of defense now, you know, even someone like last year, Emmanuel Forbes, you know, who is only 180 pounds. I don't know how well he fits into this defense now, especially as an outside player. So getting someone with Jackson's size, physicality, ability to win the line of scrimmage, really, really valuable. And then, you know, Theo Johnson, one of the, I think he's one of the fastest risers coming out of the senior bowl and the combine at tight end. I wouldn't be shocked if he's the second tight end off the board, but, you know, just looking at, looking at this roster, there's been a lot of picks by the pick 100 for Washington, which is great for team building. But, you know, Zach Ertz is, you know, coming off a year where he didn't even play last year, really. So finding that long-term tight end, I think, would be super, super valuable in this in this scheme. Uh, having someone that can be that middle-of-the-field type guy, uh, Theo Johnson has really, really good athleticism, really good size. So, you know, he might not be a, you know, quote-unquote starter with Zach Ertz there, but he would very quickly be, you know, a top-two tight end here. So last question, I know we got about a minute left here. So you're, I know I'll get you a quick take on free agency. And is there one guy they signed that jumps out to you? Yeah. I mean, I, I love that they attacked in free agency with a lot of short-term contracts of guys who could come in and play right away. Um, I, I like the Tyler Beatish signing. Uh, mm-hmm. I think finding a center, you know, getting someone that can anchor the offensive line, also taking him from a rival, always uh, applaud when you yeah. can make a move like that. But you know, getting that continuity, like we were talking about in Michigan, fr- starting to build that continuity up front is super important. You know, bringing in Andrew Wiley last year, Nick Allegretti this year, if they can find that left tackle, this could start to be an offensive line that, that looks pretty good. Matt, I appreciate your time. Really good insight. Check out his seven-round mock on ESPN+, Plus, and it's really good. And I love those things because it put you take it takes a lot of time and effort to put those together and a lot of really good insight. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, appreciate it, John. Thank you. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Matt for joining me and thank you as always for tuning in. I'll be back with another episode probably on Wednesday morning. That's what I'm expecting. So if not, it'll be later in the day, Wednesday, regardless, some point Wednesday, I'll have another episode. I'll talk to you next time.